Hello, it's Kat here and today this is the fifth of the series that I'm doing looking at the fifth house in astrology and particularly how it relates to creativity. It relates to other things as well but um, I'm really focusing on creativity because this is the creative introvert. So in each of these episodes what we do is we look at the ruler of the fifth house going through each of the signs and we look at where that ruler is uh, or the lord of the fifth house is uh, in every single sign, let's say if you are a Scorpio rising, which is what we're doing today. And we've done all of the signs starting from Cancer. So this is, we're up to number five and I'm going to keep going until I've got 12, hopefully. Hopefully I don't give up before then. So yeah, I started with Cancer rising and today we'll be up to Scorpio rising. And if you'd like the links to any of those, I'm going to link to the playlist below this video as well. So if you have Scorpio rising, that means your fifth house is aligned with Pisces, at least in the whole sign house system, which is what I'm going to be using. And Pisces is the feminine or the yin domicile of Jupiter. Jupiter here really wants to spread his benevolence to all beings. He doesn't care for boundaries. He just wants to spread his light and possibly his seed to everyone, friend or foe. I associate Pisces with the more spiritual side of Jupiter, comparing it to Sagittarius, his other um, home sign. And as well as that, the side of Jupiter that relates to our intuition, a felt sense of knowing that comes from within, as opposed to from external senses. It's also, as always, helpful to think about the time of year that corresponds with Pisces season, when the sun is in Pisces, because uh, this gives us a lot more information about what these signs actually mean. So in the Northern Hemisphere, when the sun is in its last sign before the light tips over again and dominates, so that happens at the spring equinox when the sun moves into Aries, Pisces is that moment just before daybreak. And you've probably heard that phrase, it's always darkest before the dawn. For this reason, Pisces can also feel somewhat melancholic, the feeling of existential crises, and maybe a bit impatient. Why can't I be at the fin finish line yet? Will I ever get there? And with that, maybe comes a bit of disappointment or frustration. But not without that sense of Jupiterian optimism. And Pisces is also a mutable or a double bodied sign. So, following on from that sense of optimism mixed with disillusionment or frustration, there is this inherent contradictory nature to Pisces which can feel a lot like inner turmoil. It's also helpful here to look at the glyph, the two fishes set against each other. Like with all mutable or double-bodied signs, Pisces are quick to change their mind, or at least they don't struggle against it. Their biggest struggle might just be that they are conflicted internally. So all of the double-bodied signs come before a change in the light, before the solstices or equinoxes. And again, this relates to how they are a bit of one season, a bit of another. And finally, Pisces is of the water element. So we associate the water elements as being cold and wet, kind of like a fish. So with Pisces, we get fluidity, receptivity, going with the flow like water, but not without power. Remember that water can move earth and put out fire. It's also what's needed for life to grow. So Pisces individuals can be incredibly powerful, especially when they believe in something. So that's the vague and archetypal bit over with. Now we're going to get into the real um, practical examples and I'll be looking at various creative celebrities to illustrate my points as well. So knowing Pisces, knowing the fifth house um, sign itself won't tell you everything you need to know about how creativity shows up for you. We're also going to look at the lord of that sign and for your own chart, which I won't be um, getting into this, but looking at the different planets that might be in that sign. It doesn't matter if you don't have any planets in that sign, that's kind of what the series is about. But if you do have planets in that sign, keep in mind that they're all going to have, um, they're all going to bring their own impact to that house. And if you're interested in discussing your chart personally with me, uh, you can do that. Just go to thecreativeintrovert.com slash astrology. You can find out more about the readings I offer there. And we can talk about your creative journey as well. So I think now we're ready to look at that Lord of Pisces, which is Jupiter. So Jupiter is on his very best form in a day chart, whether it's in his own domicile or exaltation or in a fire sign as he's the triplicity ruler of fire. 
But in a night chart, Jupiter is going to show more of his difficult side. In general, Jupiter is the greater benefic and it tends to bring out abundance, expansion, and just says yes to whatever comes along his path. Now, depending on what house and sign Jupiter finds himself to be in your chart, it's going to say quite a lot about how you express yourself creatively if you're a Scorpio rising. So running through each of these signs and houses, starting from Scorpio, um, and keep in mind, it, it does make a difference whether you were born at day or night. Jupiter is going to be even more benefic during the day. So starting with the first house, Jupiter is in Scorpio here, your um, first house. Uh, this is Mars's home sign. So Jupiter is now uh, going to be disposed of by Mars. And wherever Mars is in your chart as well is going to be really relevant. So the first house represents the self the body, your appearance, your psychology, things that happen to you personally. And Scorpio is associated with hidden matters. So it could be that the native is particularly interested in the occult, whilst also trying to keep their strong moral values intact. So Jupiter is also concerned with morality and kind of keeping things above board. So these people might get a little bit aggressive over their beliefs, uh, depending on where Mars is, because Mars kind of wants to bring the fight. Uh, but basically, they aren't likely to bend on their convictions. Scorpio is a fixed sign and quite determined in what it wants and what it's after. And they're also often able to see things that others can't. Again, um, you're kind of combining the intuitive nature of Jupiter with that penetrating, um, seeking nature of Scorpio. So spotting things, maybe doing creative things that might be seen as a bit radical or taboo by some people. Gianni Versace, who is the famous fashion designer, um, he had this placement. And his aesthetic combined luxurious classicism with overt sexuality. Again, we associate um, Scorpio with sex, which is because of Mars. And this attracted a lot of criticism in addition to praise about his work. He was someone who uh, divided opinion quite a lot. I think it's also interesting that there's quite a lot of scorpionic mystery that surrounds Versace's death. Moving on to the second house, here Jupiter is in a square to the fifth house planet. So there's going to be a little bit more tension to be found here. Uh, the second house represents finances, resources, and anything that supports you personally. Sagittarius is Jupiter's own domicile, so he does pick up his dignity here. And this could bode really well for the native's resources from creative work, or that it maybe assists them in their creative way, work. It might be that they're able to travel or assisted in travel and exploration. I say this because Sagittarius is often associated with um, travel, but particularly just anything that goes out into the world and explores uh, in order to gain information. They might also be a bit spendy in their habits. So, you know, Jupiter wants to say yes to everything. So if he wants to say yes to every purchase because it wants to experience new things, then maybe there's a native there who um, spends a little bit too much money. Jerry Halliwell of the Spice Girls had this placement. Uh, it seems that she does very well with money as a resource. She amassed £40 million when she was in the Spice Girls. Um, I think it's interesting that the second house is also related to food, as that is a resource that supports the native. So Halliwell has spoken out about her experiences with bulimia, saying that she came close to death, you know, at one point weighing just seven stone, and she was advised by Robbie Williams, no less, to, you know, seek some help. And in 2011, however, she's had a turnaround. So she spoke of being much more comfortable with her body and credits uh, having a baby to helping with this. So yeah, that's, um, again, Jupiter kind of taking things to the extreme. And if that's related to food in her second house, I can, I can see how that um, also plays in. And the relation of that to her creative work, which is very much in the public eye. Moving on to the third house. Jupiter is in a sextile here to the fifth house planet, so an easier aspect. The third house represents short distance travel, siblings, 
regular communications and publications um, can also represent school um, childhood friends. Capricorn is the domicile of Saturn and it's also the sign where Jupiter is in his fall. Um, so Jupiter in his fall, it just means that it's like falling on hard times. It doesn't mean that it's consistent throughout the native's life. It just means that at some points uh, this can have this can be a bit harder for Jupiter to be Jupiterian. So if you imagine Jupiter in Saturn's home, Jupiter wants to expand everything and bring abundance and um, have feasts. Saturn is quite opposite in nature to that. Um, is probably quite minimalist and austere in in his home environment, and just really wants to, especially with Capricorn, just wants to buckle down and do some work. And Jupiter might want to have a party. So. So Jupiter in the third house could represent having many siblings. So we're just expanding the topics of the third house. Maybe ambitious siblings. So taking on that Capricorn element. Maybe difficulties with them. Maybe they're quite austere and the Jupiter uh, native is, is not like that. Uh, it also relates to publishing regularly. So this could be the uh, determination and drive and maybe being very prolific to publish a lot of creative work um, regularly, things like magazines or blogs, pamphlets. And Jupiter is a lot more cautious, maybe pessimistic in this sign, so that could also flavour the native's creative work. And quite got goal-driven, of course, with, with the Capricorn. So Robert Altman, an American film director, screenwriter and producer, has this placement. He's a five-time nominee of the Academy Award for Best Director and an enduring figure from the New Hollywood era. Uh, Altman was considered a maverick in making films with a highly naturalistic but stylized and satirical aesthetic, unlike most Hollywood films. And I really feel like this says um, it has that kind of Capricornian, uh, Saturnian vibe to it, uh, not overly happy and flashy by various critics. Like it's hard to define what, what, he, um, what genre he fits into. It's kind of against all genres. And this is partly due to the satirical and comedy nature of many of his films. I think it's interesting that Geraldine Chaplin, the daughter of Charlie Chaplin, compared the humour in his films to her father's films. She said, they're funny in the right way, funny in a critical way, Saturn, of what the world is and the world we live in. They were both geniuses in their way. They alter your experience of reality. They have their world and they have their humour. That humour is so rare. And what's even crazier is, guess who else is a Scorpio rising with um, Jupiter in the third house? Charlie Chaplin. So <laughs> I think that's great that both these um, people shared a similar aesthetic and a similar sense of humour, and they had that placement. So the fourth house, Jupiter is in aversion to the fifth. Aquarius is Sat Saturn's other domicile. So we again have a little bit more of a restri restrained Jupiter here. The fourth house represents roots, parents, ancestors, your home. This can re represent a bit of a hard upbringing. Maybe they had a very domineering parent whose beliefs were forced onto the native. So the beliefs being Jupiter again, uh, maybe more cold or distant parents. And again, this can all affect their creative work. Um, the writer, George Eliot, who also Sorry, her name was Mary Ann Evans, but she went by the pen name of George Eliot. She was a very true to the outsider nature of Aquarius. She, although female authors at the time, so this is in the, I believe the 1800s, um, they were published under their own names during her lifetime, but she wanted to escape the stereotype of women's writing being judged as, you know, lighthearted romances. She also wanted to have her fiction judged separately from her already extensive and widely known work as an editor and critic. So an editor, a critic, these are things that Saturn gives the native. The young Evans was a voracious reader and obviously intelligent. And because she was not considered physically beautiful, Evans was not thought to have much chance of marriage. And this, coupled with her intelligence, led her father to invest in an education not often afforded to women. So maybe the Saturn element um, says something about her father who had high ambitions for her, but uh, didn't really allow her to go the, the standard path. Probably that's a, it's a good thing. It's like, um, this is the nature of Aquarius being the outsider, doing things differently. 
So when Evans began to question her religious faith, her father, however, this is the sad part, threatened to throw her out of the house, but his threat was not carried out. Instead, she respectfully attended church and continued to keep house for him until his death in 1849, when she was 30. Five days after her father's funeral, she travelled to Switzerland with her radical friends, the Brays. So it's pretty unusual um, way to live life, especially then. Um, and she was obviously really drawn to the creative uh, outsiders, like her friends, the Brays, who we won't get into today, but basically um, lived a pretty radical life. In the fifth house, so Jupiter is in his own domicile again, and in the house of creativity. Jupiter and Pisces, a little, a little bit more of a, a kind of cool down, um, less assertive Jupiter than when he's in Sagittarius. Uh, this is because, like I mentioned earlier, Pisces is a water sign. It's combining uh, Jupiter's hot, dry nature with the cold, wet nature of Pisces. The fifth house represents creativity, of course, but it also represents things like children, play, sport, sex, things we do for fun and recreation. Creative work might be particularly imaginative, free-flowing, and lacking boundaries here. So it's, you know, impressionist painting versus, like, pop art. Uh, it's shoegaze music. It's stream-of-consciousness writing. Sigmund Freud had this placement, and his creative work took the form of therapeutic techniques in the field of psychoanalysis, which he basically founded. And it's interesting that so many of his techniques are very Piscean. Uh, they challenge boundaries, free association, dream analysis. He also discovered transference, which is the confusion of boundaries as a patient projects their beliefs about the other onto the therapist and vice versa. Uh, so again, we're just playing with this idea of the fluidity of these boundaries here and how that impacted his creative work. Uh, I also think it's interesting, like a lot of interesting people have this exact placement. So Nietzsche, Goethe, George Orwell, Ed, Edgar, uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, yeah, so it's interesting. The sixth house. Jupiter is in Aries here, in Mars's sign again, and in aversion to the fifth. So he can't see his fifth house to be particularly active there. The sixth house represents health issues, laborious work. You know, it was originally associated with slavery. The native here could suffer from overworking. We see this a lot. Um, related to either their like fanaticalism, their fanaticism, uh, their beliefs, um, or just their creative drive. Um, it can also relate to addiction as well. Robin Williams had this placement, arguably the funniest man of all time. During a Playboy interview in 1992, Williams was asked whether he ever feared losing the balance between his work and his life. He replied, there's that fear. If I felt like I was becoming not just dull, but a rock, that I couldn't speak, fire off, or talk about things, if I'd start to worry or got, got too afraid to say something, if I stop trying, I get afraid. And there's that fighter, that's Jupiter and Aries. He can't be dull. He refuses to be dull, and he doesn't, you know, the worst fear is not having something to say or to fire off. He had various drug problems in his life, and Again, this could be related to his creative lifestyle uh, as a comedian and possibly a cause of his severe depression before death was Louis body disease, um, which is a, and he had a particularly extreme case. His wife said, Robin was losing his mind and he was aware of it. He just kept saying, I just want my, I just want to reboot my brain. So Mars is the ruler of the sixth house and is also in cancer, a sign related to, um, the mind and memory. So it's kind of all tied up here. The seventh house. Jupiter is in a sextile to the fifth house and is in Venus's domicile, Taurus. The seventh house represents relationships, partnerships, uh, and yeah, nice place to have a Venus related sign. So it could be that the partner benefits their creative work or that the partner um, is very prominent uh, creatively. So Emma Jung, Carl Jung's wife, had this placement. And she was actually the one who financed and supported Jung in his creative work. So in this case, it's kind of weird because um, I guess her partner here is kind of like Jupiter. And, um, you know, this very 
prominent uh, legendary psychoanalyst and Emma was the one who supported him financially because she was the daughter of a wealthy industrialist. Um, and at the time of their marriage, she was the second richest heiress in Switzerland. So even though Jung seemed to have affairs with Tony Wolfe and Sabrina, uh, Sabina Spielrein, he never actually left Emma. And Emma was creative too. She did research and did publish. Um, and I think it's kind of sweet and interesting that Jung remained faithful to Emma in a way that maybe only serious scholars and academics can understand. He promised never to talk or write about the Grail legend, as Emma had spent 30 years of her life researching the Grail story, and like that was her thing, and he didn't want to encroach on it. So she died before her work was published, but, she, uh, but Jung asked Mary Louise von Franz, one of his colleagues, to finish it and made sure that it was published. So in that way, Jung, her partner, did assist her creative work, even though she wasn't actually alive maybe to see it. Um, he did really help her get her creativity out there into the world. And you can read that um, story as well online. Moving on to the eighth house. So Jupiter is in a square to the fifth house here and in Gemini. So not a very helpful aspect. And he's in his exile or his detriment. And the way to think about this is that Jupiter is just quite opposite in many ways to uh, the significations of Gemini, um, which is ruled by Mercury. Uh, so if Jupiter is the intuition and um, believing in something, even if you don't have all the facts necessarily, Gemini is quite the opposite in that it really wants to think and use logic and uh, critical thinking. So the eighth house represents taxes, death, debt, inheritance, things that you get from your partner. So in contrast to that last placement, here the native might be burned by what they get from their partner. Um, it might be that the partner is dishonest in some way, or that the native is uh, dishonest, you know, to their partner. And that ends up costing them in, you know, a lot of money, a lawsuit. So Thomas Edison had this placement, and we're kind of looking at children here because the fifth house also represents children. Um, and I think it's interesting that his son wanted to be an inventor but not having much of an aptitude for it he actually became quite a problem for his father and his father's business so starting in the 1890s thomas jr became involved in snake oil products and shady and fraudulent enterprises so he's he's being dishonest he's trying to sell these snake oil products to the public um calling them the latest edison discovery and the situation became so bad that Thomas Sr., Thomas Edison, the dad, had to take his son to court to stop the practices until finally agreeing to pay Thomas Jr. an allowance of $35 um, a week in exchange for not using the Edison name. It's quite an interesting fifth house, eighth house example there. Grace Kelly, the Princess of Monaco, this is just a, quite a small example, but um, after she became the princess, married the Prince of Monaco, Prince Rainier, um, she ended up having to kind of turn down a lot of the movie roles that she had up until then been known for. She was this amazing film star. And uh, for example, Hitchcock offered her a role in the 19 uh, 1962 film Marnie. Uh, and she was keen, but the public outcry in Monaco against her involvement in a film where she would play a, a kleptomaniac made her reconsider and ultimately reject the project. And this probably happened many times. Uh, another example is when director Herbert Ross tried to interest her in a part in his film, The Turning Point, but her husband, Prince Rainier, quashed the idea. So we've got things that come from your partner, maybe affecting in a negative way her creative career. Moving on to the ninth house, Jupiter is in, tri in a trine to the fifth house here. So harmonious aspect again, Cancer is the domicile of the moon. And Jupiter is in his exaltation here. We associate Cancer as a very bright time in the year. We associate Jupiter with the light and uh, life, which is also um, a lunar thing, um, new life and being able to nurture things. So they go hand in hand. The ninth house represents higher education, philosophy, travel, and it's interesting that the moon was also traditionally associated with travel. 
Uh, if you think about it in the sky, it's very noticeable that it moves very fast as something that travels. And it might be that travel plays a big part in the native's creative work. Rupert Sheldrake is an English author and a researcher in the field of parapsychology who proposed the con concept of morphic resonance, um, which kind of lacks a lot of the mainstream acceptance and has been characterized as pseudoscience. Again, this is quite a Jupiterian thing, um, believing in something even though it lacks a lot of uh, the evidence that the scientific, scientific method um, wants things to have. His work has also taken him abroad. He spent a year and a half in India in the Satchitananda ashram to focus on his writing of a new science of life. This also ties into religion, another ninth house Jupiter topic. Uh, Sheldrake reported being drawn back to a Christian path during his time in India and self-identifies as Ang Anglican. In the tenth house, Jupiter here is an aversion to the fifth. He's in Leo, the sun's domicile. And the tenth house represents our career, what we're known for. So the native is having uh, a nice connection here between career and fifth house topics of creativity, maybe. So this is a really public facing Jupiter and the native is likely to real, uh, reach some real prominence for their creative work. So we've got Diana Ross with this placement, who's, I mean, looking at her hair, a real Leonine character. So she shot to fame uh, very early in her life in The Supremes. And Ross has influenced many artists, including Michael Jackson, Beyonce, Madonna. And as the lead singer of The Supremes and also as a solo artist, she's earned 18 number one sing singles. So incredible success and incredible public prominence. Jupiter in the 11th house. So here Jupiter is in Virgo, opposing the fifth and again, back in his exile. So not the happiest place for Jupiter in many ways, but it doesn't mean that you still can't have a really, um, it doesn't mean that those topics of the 11th house would necessarily go badly. It just means that Jupiter isn't a natural in this particular sign because Virgo is the domicile of Mercury um, and is more concerned with the details, the analysis of things. So with Jupiter there, uh, he is in his joy. So the 11th house is like extra Jupiterian because it represents groups, communi communities, benefactors, people that support us in our 10th house, our career matters. Jupiter might find uh, itself a bit frustrated in this place and the creative work might, affect, uh, might reflect this. So it might affect how the native associates with groups they might find that it's easier for them to go their own way because maybe their uh, creative beliefs and opinions uh, rub up against groups um, and other people. D.H. Lawrence uh, had this placement. Lawrence's opinions earned him many enemies and he endured official persecution, censorship and misrepresentation of his creative work throughout the second half of his life. Um, much of which he spent in voluntary exile, literally in exile, like Jupiter is in its exile, <laughs> uh, which he called his savage pilgrimage. At the time of his death, his public reputation was that of a pornographer who had wasted his considerable talents. E.M. Forster, in an obituary notice, I don't know why I can't say that word, uh, challenged this widely held view, describing him as the greatest imaginative novelist of our generation. There's literally a section of his Wikipedia page that's titled Exile. Yeah, I just find that fascinating. So the 12th house, wrapping up, Jupiter is again in aversion to the 5th house and Libra is the domicile of Venus. So the 12th house represents hidden matters, remote places, times of crisis and maybe a bit of self undoing. So Jupiter's undoing here may be an over concern with justice. He already has that association um, as you know, somebody's a planet that is associated with law and justice, but it's really turned up and maybe even distorted in this house in Libra. Edward Norton had this has this placement. 
So it's really fascinating to see um, someone who is an incredible, in my opinion, actor um, and does some really amazing things for the environment as well. But he's had a lot of difficulties on like the, the, the behind the scenes part of making movies. He kind of has this tendency to rewrite scripts and um, piss off directors. Uh, this has just happened like a bunch of times. So for example, um, he had this a role with the Marvel Cinematic Universe's Bruce Banner and the accompanying alter ego Hulk in the um, big budget superhero film The Incredible Hulk, released in 20, 2008. So Norton initially turned down this part as he felt that the 2003 version Hulk strayed far afield from a story that was familiar to people. He then provided rewrites of the script every day of filming. <laughs> so director Louis Leteria welcomed his contributions at first, saying that Edward's script has given Bruce's story real gravitas. However, screenwriter Zach Penn was displeased with Norton's changes. And anyway, um, the Writers Guild of America credited Penn as the sole writer, arguing that Norton had not contributed significantly to the screenplay. Uh, Norton did not prom- uh, participate in promoting the film and went to Africa for humanitarian activities instead. And um, this has happened just so many times, it's almost countless. So Red Dragon, he appeared on set with his own script, then argued with the director, Frida. He also rewrote the screenplay, uh, but the Writers Guild again refused to give him credit as he trashed their rules, basically. He's basically a bit of a pain in the ass to work with because he has this idea of what the films should be and clearly has this real sense of justice and wants to make sure that all of his creative work upholds that. This is Jupiter and Libra uh, in the 12th house. He probably isn't even aware of it himself, but the people around him are like, mate, you've got a problem. Um, American History X, there's another one which he starred in. Um, He thought that the editor in the cut, cut it out, cut it down too much. So uh, it was 75 minutes and they allowed Norton to do a recut and he pushed up to that two hours of the version that we know. And Tony Kay, the editor, I believe he was the editor, he might've been something else, but he requested his name to be changed in the credits to Humpty Dumpty as he was so upset with Norton's cut. Um, and he told that people that Norton is a narcissistic dilettante who raped the film. I mean, it's a great film. Norton clearly made it better, but each to their own. So that's what we've got for uh, Pisces in the Fifth House. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Um, If you have this placement, I'd really like to hear how creativity shows up for you. Let me know in the comments or email hello at thecreativeintrovert.com. And if you are interested in getting a reading with me and discussing how creativity shows up more specifically in your life, you can check out my options at thecreativeintrovert.com slash astrology. I think that's all we've got. I'll catch you next time.